Hey, everybody. It's the Drive to School Podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host, and uh, my good friend Paige is back. How are you doing, Paige? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good this week. Uh, it, it's turning into fall. It's it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's, it's my jam. Um, what are we going to talk about today, though? Ooh, we're going to talk about how, you know, your church worker isn't perfect. <sighs> I think maybe even just the, the way to start with that uh, might even be to be specific about it uh, because everybody will be specific about it, like not around your church worker, your pastor, your deaconess, your DCE. Uh, people love to talk about why your your pastor, your church worker, your DCE, your deaconess isn't perfect. But um, can they be forgiven? Oh, absolutely. Okay. More than that, um, what does that mean for uh, the church? Well, I mean, to me, when I hear like church worker isn't perfect and somebody starts, you know, talking about their church worker i'm like well we're all sinners we're all made up of like just because we're church workers doesn't mean we're better than anybody we're still of that same like we're all sinners we just have a different and a little bit more public type of office at some points and it's kind of easy to maybe use your church worker as almost like a scapegoat for your own frustrations that maybe you should talk to your church worker about. So that's, that's what I normally hear it in context, at least. A couple of things there. Um, first, your, your, your church worker is somebody who is, is a, a representative of Jesus in some way. Your pastor actually stands in the stead and by the command of Jesus. He is Jesus' mouth to your church. Uh, but even your, your deaconess is, is in, in a lot of ways, his hands and his feet sometimes, your DCE. Um, all of those, those people who are sort of knit together to, to the support roles are still, in, in a way, standing in a place uh, where people expect to find perfection because God is perfect. Um, and, and so not only do they find out very quickly we're not actually God, we just represent him, uh, but then you also have to, to sort of pick up some of the anger along the way. Um, I guess maybe the two questions to get with uh, unpack from here are, are, can God work through sinners? Because if he can't, then you're right, you need to keep looking until you find a perfect one. But also, um, sometimes is that anger ever just sort of misplaced because it's actually at God himself? And, and like, what do you do then? So let's do first one. Um, can God work through sinners? We, we've, we've done this before, but it might be worth reiterating. Yeah, absolutely. God can work through sinners. If he couldn't work through sinners, then we would be in a really bad predicament right now. Like, right. There's nobody else. Yeah. I mean, we have Jesus, but until he comes again, like we, we have us and we have, you know, the pastors who speak in the stead of Christ and, you know, we're still sinners in that so way. And it's not even just like everybody's a sinner, um, but you're right. First of all, if God's going to work through sinners, he's, he's only got sinners. Like there's no other choice for him. But but it also sort of unpacks why he gives us the fourth commandment the way that he does. He says, honor your father and mother. And as Lutherans, we, we understand too, this means that uh, we, we should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. We honor our authorities, our church workers, uh, not because they have earned it by their own work, not because they, they have earned it by their own sacrifice or because they don't get paid enough or some other joke, uh, but it's because God wants to work through them. That That's actually where the honor comes from. It's, it's actually a, it's a comfort to us when we look at them and we're like, you're not somebody who I would probably respect on my own. You, you can say, well, can God still work through me? Because if that's the case, then all of a sudden it becomes a special thing. Uh, in, in the same way, um, if God is going to, to sort of put his blessing and his promise to your parents, your, your parents don't have to be perfect and without sin. Your parents just have to be something that God can use for good. And if you can expect good from your parents, good from your pastor, good from your deaconess and your church worker, then you get to say, I'm not happy about the specific sins that are going on here, but um, I know that they're not going to stop God from getting done what he needs to do, that his word would be preached, that his sacraments administered, that the church be held together in compassion where the deaconesses and the DCEs work, where, where all of those things are, are put together. Yeah, there's um, definitely something to be said about remembering that we are there to help as well. Like we're, we're not just here to be like, you should be doing this, 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 and this, because I already know how to do it. Like we're there to teach. We're there to help. We're there to guide. We're not there to accuse necessarily, at least the deaconesses and DCEs, like that kind of falls in the realm of, you know, the office of public ministry. We're not quite sure. that. Yeah. You're not that. Yeah. But um, I, I mean, also f for that, um, do you ever think that church workers just catch some of the flack that people are just upset with God right now? Yeah, they 
we're kind of there and we're in that position is like, oh, church, church worker. I'm mad at this thing in the church. Therefore, I'm mad at my church worker. And that um, is something that is seen every so often. So, yeah. Sometimes even just, I'm going to say mad at God. Mad at God that that somebody's not getting better. Mad at God that, um, you know, this thing that you love seems to be struggling. Mad at God for any number of personal or private reasons. And sometimes that comes out a little bit sideways. Um, in all of it, though, again, sort of the, the comfort in this isn't just like, well, nobody's perfect or, or you know, pastors are people too or deaconesses can't be perfect. Uh, it, it, it's your, your pastor, or your deaconess is going to be a very specific kind of poor, miserable sinner. Uh, the longer you get to know them, the more you're going to get to know that, that your pastor will have an ego or your pastor will have anxiety. Your pastor will have specific kinds of sins. Um not only does Jesus forgive them, but promises to work anyway. But that also means when you kind of come across them, uh, you, you mentioned that you should talk to your church worker. What, what do you mean by that? It sounds frustrating. Well, um, some people just don't like, and church workers included, like we need to talk to each other as well. Um, because there's a lot of miscommunication when you're not verbalizing your frustrations. So maybe you are mad at God and you need you're taking that out on your church worker or what have you, you need to still talk to that person and be like, Hey, we're like, recognize we're all in this together and we're here to help. And um, it's just something that isn't really going to go, go away because we're all sinful, but it's something that we can come together in and help each other through. Absolutely. And that, that happens when sinners forgive each other. Um, to actually put it out there and say, this thing that you're doing, it's not okay. You're forgiven for it, but let's also try and work and, and, and live together. Um, I, I think there's there's something beautiful, though, when we start to actually zoom out and recognize um, that the church is, is supposed to be marred this way. Um, the visible church on earth, it, it's supposed to be um, the, the, the church militant, they call us. Um, soldiers are, are banged up sometimes. Soldiers are, are, are kind of ugly sometimes. And, and uh, it's, it's because of what you, you go through. It's because of what you keep enduring. It's because of what you keep doing. Uh, but, but God would knit us together and, and call us glorious, call us holy, um, and, and even unite us to the church triumphant that, that have already made it through uh, in, in such a way that it lets us sort of step back and take a look at some of the problems that we use at church um, as sort of justification to either say the whole thing's falling off or maybe a reason not to go anymore. Um, if God is working this much good through your church, church uh when you say these little things what are you supposed to think about them in, in relation to sort of like the the big picture um I, honestly that's one of the questions that i came into this podcast hoping that we could discuss but i'm not honestly sure what to say in that situation sure so i i mean because you get to recognize there are things that are going to happen in a church that you're not going to like. Every single person would do at least one thing different. Everybody. Um, nobody's going to pick your favorite hymns every single Sunday. Somebody's going to say something that they either shouldn't have said by mistake or, or sometimes just good old fashioned on purpose got angry. Um, it, it's easy to sort of say, I'm going to take my ball and go home. I don't go to church to hang out with the people there. I, I, I don't. I, I don't go to church because it's, it's the most fun place I've ever been. I go to church because I need the forgiveness of sins. I go to church because I need Jesus. And and so as long as Jesus is being given there, um, you, you get to sort of step back and, and take a pause and realize that there's something wonderful about taking communion is that that it is all of us joined together at that rail. Um, there's that symbol in the common cup that a lot of churches have, that, that we are, are um, all partaking of one cup, that, that your forgiveness is my forgiveness, is everybody's forgiveness because it's all coming from Jesus. It's actually a really wonderful thing uh, when, when things sort of feel frustrating is to go and take communion with the people that you're mad at because then you can at least say god forgives them i'm going to work on forgiving them too um when when those things in church start to to take away from the gospel and they always do they overshadow the gospel that the fights in church the gossip in church all of those things you get to recognize who's really at work there um that's the devil the devil's at at work to turn the church into a social club 
the devil's at work and in, in, to turn the church into anything that you cannot hear Jesus preach the forgiveness of sins. in. And so if that's the case, like that's, that's why we don't want conflict in church because not just because God can work anyway, but, but because it distracts from the preaching of the gospel. Um, if, if all anybody can think about when they, they went in there is some trivial thing that everybody's really, really upset with, or even some not so trivial thing that everybody's really, really upset with. Uh, who do you think is winning the day? Anything that silences the preaching of the gospel is, is, wholly and completely of the devil. So if that's the case, then, then we deal with it. And, and again, we have we have confession and absolution. You said we have the office of the keys for that. Um, where those things start to fester and take root, uh, what's wonderful is that the church can can gather around the gifts of God that forgive all of us and try and focus on those instead of who is right and who is wrong. We've talked about this before too, but there's a big difference between helping and winning. Um, it, it seems like whenever somebody's wrong in church, it immediately will set aside help uh, because you should be helped by God, not by me who represents him or, you know, or this is the body of Christ. But, but instead I'm going to be right until you learn your lesson. Um, and again, instead of this, you get to recognize that um, in, in all of it, uh, you have something bigger going on here. Uh, we just got to celebrate the, um, the, the feast of saint michael the archangel um and you and i were talking about this the other day um and i, I even kind of I, I shared a sermon that I, I got to go and preach um it, it, when we go looking for all of the the spiritual warfare the, the angelic conflict between good and evil um we never really quite realize that it plays itself out in really physical ways uh the, the war in heaven was won when jesus died on the cross and the devil lost the ability to accuse you of your sins but spiritual warfare plays itself out in church when we we look at the battles that we fight and try and replace them with that cross that forgives our sins. We, we look at it, our job to defend the church against, and then we pick the people that are supposed to be in the church, not attacking the church, being in the church, defend the church against Satan, defend the church against false doctrine, defend the church against uh, the idea that it would simply be a place where the good go to get better. But in all of it, you get to sort of gather uh, and, and rejoice uh, together around the gifts that, that forgive all of us. And that is spiritual warfare. That That is the, the sinners who cannot save themselves or fight entirely of themselves being gathered up into him who's already won the victory. Um, does that kind of, does that kind of get after it? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, so whenever I hear this conflict that people are like, oh, my pastor said this, I'm not sure I can go here. And it's appropriate to kind of ask, like, is he still preaching the word faithfully? Right. If that's if the answer is yes, then go to the pastor and work out your differences. If he's not yeah. preaching the word faithfully, then that's a bigger problem. So if we're just looking at the um, church workers aren't perfect, he just said something that or she just said something a little out of pocket. This is like, oh, okay, like I just need to talk to them about it. Right. But if they're purposely taking the word and misconstruing it and not, you know, defending our faith the way that we're brought up in the way that the Bible says and all this, like, then that's an even bigger problem. So what do we do then? Right. When should you stop going to your church? When should you stop calling your pastor, your pastor? And and if it's because he's being weird or, or even just a sinner, like that's worth talking. So I don't know about um, the, uh, the commissioning rights for the deaconesses, uh, my ordination rights. I, I, I promise with the help of God to do a few things, not, not as many as you would think either uh, to preach the word of God uh, truly, according to the Holy scriptures and the Lutheran confessions to administer the sacraments, according to God's institution uh, to visit the sick and the dying and to admonish the people to holy living. That, that, that's it. When I stop doing those things, you should find a different church. Full stop. Um, but but here's the thing. It's it's not just sort of like suck it up and deal with it. But there's a reason that that um, you don't want to you don't want to cut and run every time your pastor is weird or a sinner. Um, and that's that sooner or later you're going to be in a position where you can't run, but you're going to need to have somebody come see you. Um, sooner or later you're going to be laying in a hospital bed somewhere. And do you want somebody to come and see you even if he happens to be a sinner? Uh, if you spend all of your time running, as soon as you find out somebody's a specific kind of poor miserable sinner, you, you're never actually going to really have a shepherd to care for your soul. And that's the thing that, that your pastor's actually been given to do. Your church workers have been given to do. If you spend your whole life running, as soon as somebody upsets you, uh, forgiveness gets to be a pretty hollow thing. And if you spend your whole life running from the people who are sent to care for you by God almighty, uh, it gets, it gets to be harder to care when push comes to shove. And you might be at a place where it's just fine right now, but when that festers and that festers, well, is it, is it going to be harder for you to hear prayers for your well being when you're, when you, desperately, desperately need them because you just happen to know that they're a sinner. Um, it's not just ignore the fact because at least they're preaching the word of God, right? Uh, talk to them about 
their sin, rejoice that, that Jesus forgives them their sin, but in all of it, recognize that those things are knit together so that when push comes to shove, you would have somebody who is there uh, despite having warts, despite having weird, despite having all kinds of sin, who, who gets to go and, and bring to you the gifts that you, you really, really need on the days you really, really need them. And that's a blessing too, to be able to have somebody in your life that is there to care for you. And no matter what, like we are all sinners and we all care for each other. And you don't necessarily have to agree with everything that somebody says in order for them to still do a good job either. Right. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks for hanging out, Paige. Yeah, thanks for having me. Later.